Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Hirschfelder. I'm with the programming team here at the Commonwealth Club, and it is great to see you here in person. Um, the Commonwealth Club, as you may know, has returned to in-person programming, which we are very, very excited about. We had our most uh, in-person programs in March that we had have had in two years, and we're starting April strong, including this program. But it's also exciting is we have people watching online as well. So we welcome those who are online. I say that because of, for a couple reasons. Number one, if you have a phone, please turn it off because not only will you bother the folks here, but you will bother the folks online as well. Okay, so please turn your phones off. Next question. Members, do we have any members here today? If you do, please raise your hand. Okay, about half the group. You know what that means for the other half? You too can be a member of the Commonwealth Club. <laughs> it's an exciting time to be um, members of the club because we're doing so much in-person programming, some exclusive member programming, and there's lots of ways to be involved as a member. So we encourage you to become a member. So thank you for that. Uh, there are question cards on your seats that you can bring up to the moderator. Those who are watching online can please put your questions on the YouTube chat feature and they will be brought to the moderator as well. So with that, we're very excited tonight to introduce the two speakers, Arthur Brooks and the moderator for the program, Tully Friedman, who I will ask to come to the stage uh, and Tully will take it over from there. Thank you for that introduction. Good evening. Um, I'm really delighted to be the moderator for today's Commonwealth Club program with my friend and former partner, Arthur Brooks. I'm pleased this program is in person and that the club is planning on doing increasing numbers of in-person programs in the weeks and months to come. To learn more, visit the club's wealth website, www.commonwealthclub.org. I also, on behalf of Arthur and myself, want to say hello to everyone who's watching online. We're today, here today to have a discussion with Arthur. The two of us go back a while. I serve on the board of the American Enterprise Institute and have for many years, and Arthur led our organization for a decade. Arthur is now a professor at the Harvard Business School and the Harvard Kennedy School and focuses much of his work on how to live a happier, more fulfilled life something all of us, no matter what one's age, should aspire to. He's the author of 12 books. We're here to discuss his latest book, From Strength to Strength, Finding Success, Happiness, and Deep Purpose in the Second Half of Life. Now, let's begin. So you don't have written answers. Huh? I have written questions. <laughs> uh, your new book has rocketed to the bestseller list and remained there for several weeks. Are you surprised at how well it's done? Thanks, Tully, and, and thanks to all of you. Um, for those of you who are in, in virtual land, um, looking forward to seeing some of you in person soon, and for all of you who've come out in person, so grateful to have this opportunity to, to talk about this new book. Um, Tully and I, as you mentioned, we go back a long time. We go back about 15 years at this point. We've become very close personal friends. We spent, uh, it's, it's it's so great to be back in person with our friends. <laughs> and we spent a good part of the day here together as well. Um, you and I have been talking about this book for a long time. This is a book project that I started talking to you about about three years ago. Uh, and part of the reason is because you and I always discuss whatever I'm working on. You're somebody who is a, has consulted to me, has been somebody who's helped me with my creative work for a very long time. And I appreciate that a lot. This is a book about how all of us can get happier as we get older. In other words, how we don't have to leave happiness up to chance as we age. I'm a, I'm a social scientist. I'm, I've been working on behavioral social science topics ever since I got my PhD a long time ago as an academic for sure. But ordinarily, I don't train my toolkit on my own life. 
Um, <laughs> but I'm getting older, it turns out. And, and I didn't want to leave my own happiness up to chance. And I realized that I have studied these topics for years and years. And I have the ability to actually look at the difference between people who get happier as they get older and people get unhappier as they get older. What's the difference? What are the habits? What's the happiness 401k plan, if there is one? That's what this book is. It looks at the big patterns in people's lives. Am I surprised that it opened at number one in the New York Times bestseller list? Really surprised, as a matter of fact. I wasn't gonna publish it. It was gonna be a folder of notes to myself on what to do as I got older. And my wife, Esther, found the folder. What's this? She said, I said, oh, you know, it's gonna try to not drive you crazy as I get older. Um, and she looked at it a little bit. She said, you should publish this as a book. And I said, ah, nobody's gonna want this, you know? I teach university students. She said, I don't know. This might be somebody th thing people are interested in. And it turns out we're all suffering from the same thing. We're all looking for the same truths. We're all looking for the way that we can live better, happier lives. And we're all suffering, actually. And, and which is not a bad thing. One of the things I talk about in the book is that how the, the importance of suffering for actually f living a life full of meaning and a life full of purpose, but it has to be toward meaning and purpose. And so when I published it, it turns out that a lot of people are having the same set of experiences that I am, and they're benefiting from the book. And I'm still surprised, but I have to say I'm truly, deeply, gratefully surprised by how many people it's touching. Well, you really shouldn't be. <laughs> so there's a lot to discuss. Let's start with the problem as you see it and the solution. Right. So the problem is basically this. Um, <clears throat> Well, actually, the, the, the experience that led to this is something that you and I talked about quite a bit. You read the book in manuscript, but you also know the story that led to this. When I was still running the American Enterprise Institute, and I was running back and forth all the time. I was um, on the plane constantly. Um, you know, my job when I was running this big nonprofit was I had to raise $50 million a year and give 175 speeches a year. So it was like running for the Senate and never getting elected was my job. <laughs> And I was coming back from uh, on, a, on an evening flight from Los Angeles uh, to Washington, at, you know, one one night. And it was about eleven o'clock at night. And I was typing away on my laptop feverishly, trying to get something done that seemed really important to me, but is now completely lost to the sands of time, in my memory at least. And <clears throat> there was a couple on the plane behind me having a conversation, and I couldn't see him. It was dark, but I could tell by their voices it was a man and a woman, and I could tell by their voices that they were elderly. And, and, and after a minute, I could tell they were probably married because of the conversation that they were having. At least they knew each other really well. I couldn't quite make out the husband's words. He was sort of mumbling, but the wife's, the wife's voice was very penetrating, very piercing. So, and so he says, mumble, 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 mumble. And she says, oh, don't say it would be better if you were dead. <laughs> so now they've got my full attention. <laughs> and I'm not trying to eavesdrop, but you know, I got some pathos here. And, and again, I'm a social scientist, so what's my laboratory? It's the plane. If I overhear you, I'm going to write a book about it, probably, so, you know, careful. And, and, um, and then, you know, he mumbles some more. She says, it's not true that nobody remembers you. It's not true that, you know, nobody loves you or even knows your name anymore. And, and it went on like this for 20 minutes. And I thought, ah, oh, this is a guy who's just disappointed. He's never lived up to his own potential. He hasn't done all the things that you have. The education, the jobs, the opportunity, the companies that you started. And at the end of the flight, the lights go on and everybody stands up. And i kind of curious. So I turn around to get a look. And it's one of the most successful, famous men in the world. Somebody that we all know. He's rich. He's famous. He's powerful because of things that he did decades ago that stopped a long time ago, but people admire him. He's a hero. Holy cow. And I thought to myself, look, I, I study this stuff for a living. I'm, I'm a happiness specialist. And I'm thinking the same thing that a lot of people think, which is completely wrong, which is if you play by the rules and you work hard and you get a bunch of good luck and you work and work and achieve and you achieve and you earn and you succeed and you bank it, then you can be happy for the rest of your life. And that's wrong. That is not the right model. That will not bring you happiness. So what will bring you happiness? That's what this book is about. That's what this book is about, the happiest people, what they do. And furthermore, it's about the fact that about half of people subsequent to the age of 65 get happier and happier until the end, and the other half get unhappier until the end. And I want to be on the upper branch. Okay. Let's unpack this a little. You're what some may call a Renaissance man. You're a classical and jazz musician. 
a social scientist, a student of Eastern religions, and I guess today a bit of a self-help guru. But I'd like to turn to your work and thoughts as a political philosopher, uh, in particular on happiness. The 18th century name for this would have been moral philosophy. Among the first moral philosophers was Adam Smith, a giant of the Scottish Enlightenment. He talked about promoting human flourishing and influenced the founders, including Thomas Jefferson, who included the phrase life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness in the Declaration of Independence. So can you compare these formulations with your own view and prescription for achieving happiness are they the same? If not, how do they differ? What is happiness? Hmm. It's a big question. Um, we think about happiness very differently than the ancient philosophers did, and, and even the Enlightenment thinkers did. W w and the reason is because there's been an explosion of research on the science of happiness over the past 30 years among social scientists and neuroscientists. And so <clears throat> on the first day, of, I teach a class at the Harvard Business School called Leadership and Happiness that has two sections of 90 students. It fills immediately with 400 on the waiting list because it's happiness, you know? Free candy, kids. Everybody wants to take happiness class. And on the first day of class, I say, what is it? And, and they'll say, well, it's the feeling I get when, you know, that's, they all say something like, wrong. Happiness is not a feeling any more than your Thanksgiving dinner is the smell of the turkey. The smell of the turkey is evidence that there's something good going on. And the same thing is true with happiness. The happiness feeling that you get is evidence of, a, of, of behavioral and, and environmental phenomena, of which there are three. You can think about it this way. Your Thanksgiving dinner <clears throat> is... Is uh, you, you can describe it in, th in terms of three macronutrients. This is kind of a clinical way to think about Thanksgiving, um, which has a lot more to it than this. But it's basically carbohydrates, protein, and fat. The same thing is true for happiness. Happiness is made up of three macronutrients. They are enjoyment, satisfaction, and purpose. And there's a big neuroscientific and social scientific literature between, behind all three of those components. And if you understand those things, you can actually master them. You can understand them and put them into practice in your life and your happiness will rise. Now, what does it have to do with this legacy, this philosophical legacy that we have? The fact is that most of the happiness research, the good happiness research has happened in the United States. Why? Because we have a legacy of pursuing happiness. And we do because the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers like Adam Smith did not have the, this desiccated view of economics and politics that we often do today, unfortunately. On, on the contrary, they believed that, that, that these ideas were part of a more fulfilling life where people had to live up morally to living a good, having a good life well lived, and these were components of it. This was translated into the American Enlightenment through people like Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. Now, Thomas Jefferson, when he wrote the Declaration of Independence, we, we know him as this incredibly great writer. He was not. He was a great copier. And what he did for the Declaration of Independence is he largely cribbed the document from George Mason's Virginia Declaration of Rights, which talked about the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of property, which doesn't, it, it sounds sort of worldly or it sounds sort of materialistic, it was not. That was a, a Lockean formulation where John Locke believed that that was a, a definition of what it meant to live a good life, is to, be, to have ownership over something in, in the world but Jefferson cha tra changed it to the pursuit of happiness, not property. And he was asked later why he did so. And he said he was simply taking dictation from the American mind. It's kind of an interesting thing. In other words, this was what was on the lips of the riffraff around him. And he basically made this claim, which I wish we still all believe today. No, 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 if I do my job, over the next, for the rest of my life, I want more people to, to remember this, to believe this, that we are just ambitious riffraff in this country. That's what makes us different. You know, even this audience here, you're all, you know, different stories. I mean, your grandfather was running from some godforsaken shtetl. And, you know, my grandfather was, you know, digging, you know, or was, you know, raising pigs in Denmark. And, and, and many of our brothers and sisters were brought to this country involuntarily. But what we all have in common is this, the fact that we do proceed from ambitious riffraff and we do believe that we can pursue our happiness and define it. And that's a beautiful, wonderful thing. And all I'm doing is a happiness scientist. All I'm doing is, is saying what it is that we're looking for so I can make it a little bit easier for people to 
apply it to their lives, to make habits that'll make it possible for them, and, and most importantly, to share the ideas with others so they can pursue their happiness as well. You start out with something called the, the striver's curse. And what do we do about it? What is it? Is it something that concerns your business students? Is that why your course is so popular? Yeah, the striver's curse is a really interesting phenomenon. And this is something that I found over the course of doing the research for this book. I found that <clears throat> there's a natural trajectory in life um, to happiness as we age. We find that most people think, I ask my students, you know, they're 27, 28, I say, well, okay, 10 years from now, you're gonna be happier or unhappier? They all say happier, because they're optimists. I mean, they're the Harvard Business School, they should be optimists. I mean, their life looks pretty good to them. I say, why? 10 years from now, they say, well, because all my student loans paid off and because the person I'm in love with might be married to me, um, because uh, I'll have my business life figured out, life will be set. I say, okay, <clears throat> 38 happier than 28, good. What about 48? It's like, maybe a little happier. Maybe a little happier, uh huh? I say, what about 78? They're like, I don't want that. <laughs> and I say, why not? And they say, because it doesn't sound like it's fun to be old. Okay. Okay, let's look at the data. And I have data on hundreds of thousands of people from almost any country that you want. These are not data that I gathered, but rather from two British economists named David Andrew Oswald and, and David Blanchflower. <clears throat> and they look at you know, people from India and China and, and Sub-Saharan Africa and Australia and all over Europe, United States, South America, every place you can imagine. And it all does the same thing. People actually get unhappier over their adult lives. From early 20s to early 50s, almost everybody gets slightly unhappy. There's lots of reasons for this. It mostly has to do with having teenage kids. <clears throat> and then uh, around early 50s, it turns around, and almost everybody gets happier from early 50s to late 60s. Almost everybody. It's like a renaissance. I'm 57 right now. It's true. It's unbelievable. It has a lot to do with emotional regulation. You know, we all have the same basic negative emotions in response to outside stimuli. You know, you get angry or sad or disgusted or, or afraid or whatever it is. But when you get older, the consolation of age is that you know that you're going to get over it very quickly because of a, a neurological process called homeostasis, where we always go back to our baseline. And when you're young, you think, oh, I'm going to be heartbroken forever because somebody broke up with me. When you're older, somebody offends you or rejects you. It's like, yeah, I feel terrible right now, but I'm pretty sure that in a week I'm going to feel better, so I'm going to get a head start on feeling good right now. That's a great thing about being 57 compared to when I was 27, for sure. But then a weird thing happens in late 60s, which is, as I mentioned before, you break up into two groups. Half gets happier and happier, and half starts to go back down again. They go back down a lot. It's 50-50. It's so who are the people who go up and the people who go down? According to the way you, we normally understand the world, if you're successful early on, you're going to be on the upper branch. Bank it, man. I mean, it's like the hero on the plane. And by the way, almost everybody we think about who's unbelievably successful early on, they should die happy with a smile on their face, understanding how successful they've been. Wrong. The more successful you are early in your life, the more likely you are to be on the lower branch later. I don't want it to be true. I do not want that to be true. But it's unambiguously true. Why? Because what goes up must come down. You go up, you come, look, if you never do anything with your life, you'll never know if it's over. But if you're a striver, you're a hard worker, you're an ambitious person, you're trying to do a lot, it's gonna have to stop. And when it, stop, it stops, it hurts. Especially if it stops early, you're gonna be chasing it for a long time. And that's one of the big inspirations for this book. What is it about that up and coming up and coming down? And is that your only success curve? And what can you do? And, if you don't do anything about it, you're going to get the striver's curse and you're going to be on the lower branch. And I don't want to be on that lower branch. Now, I have a lot of friends who are not on the lower branch. You're on the upper branch. What did you do right? I mean, look, you're in the book, not named. You've seen yourself in the book. <clears throat> you're one of the case studies of people who've done it right. I want to be like you and not the guy in the plane. You know, I, this isn't about me, but a partial answer is I met you when I was 65, I think. And I've said repeatedly, you changed my life. And I learned a lot about you. A lot of what we learned was in process leading to these insights. We, by the way, we've traveled all over the world together. We've yeah. been in Barcelona, we've been in Japan, we've been in Dharamsala visiting His Holiness China, the Dalai Lama. India. We've been all over the world together, yeah. And when Los, the coronavirus Los, is firmly behind us, we'll be on the road again. Los Angeles. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> Tacoma. So yeah. the, pro the problem you've described, the solution is transitioning from one curve to another curve. Right. You haven't used the C word yet. <clears throat> you talk about the curves, how you make the transition, 
And then in your own case, how did that happen? So the Strivers curse is, the, is a, a curve of intelligence that was, oh. that was identified by social psychologists largely in the UK <coughs> in the, starting in the 1940s. And it's a curve called fluid intelligence. Now, due to the structure of the brain and the training of our, of our brains, we get much, much better through our 20s and 30s at focusing, at working indefatigable hours of innovation, of the energy to stay on a particular task. And the more we practice, the better we get. If you were a really good young lawyer or financial professional or, pretty much, or electrician or what, a bus driver, whatever you were doing, you got better and better at it through your 20s and 30s. The reason was your fluid intelligence. The problem with the fluid intelligence is it peaks in your late 30s or early 40s, and for almost everybody, it starts to decline and does so precipitously through your 40s and is falling like a rock through your 50s. And that means that, generally speaking, if you're a real striver, if you're really good at what you do, nobody will notice when you're 45 except you. And the way that you'll notice is you start getting a little bit burned out. Like, I used to like this thing. I don't like it as much as I used to. Why don't I like it? Well, because it's harder than it used to be. I hear this from 45-year-old lawyers all the time, or you know, people at Goldman Sachs. The classic thing is make a bunch of money and I guess I'll retire at 49, which is just a terrible idea. The reason is because it's not as fun, because it's not quite as easy, and so they walk away because they don't have to make the money anymore, and they don't quite know why they lost interest. It's because the fluid intelligence is in decline. Now, that's the first part of the story. And if you stay, try to stay in your fluid intelligence curve, you're going to be the man on the plane, <clears throat> and you'll get the striver's curse. But here's the good news. The social psychologist, that, led by a man named Raymond Cattell, in, particularly in the 1960s, saw there was a second curve behind it called crystallized intelligence. Crystallized intelligence increases, and again, this is a, a largely a neurophysiological phenomenon. Crystallized intelligence increases through your 40s and 50s, and stays high in your 60s and 70s and 80s and as long as God gives you your marbles. You have the second success curve waiting for you if you know it's there and you get on it. Now, what is that success curve? It's not as fast. It's not as innovative. You're not the ability to be the hot solo litigator that you were before. What you have is the ability to be the managing partner, to make the teams. It's your wisdom curve. One is raw smarts. The second is the ability to know which questions to answer. It's the ability to combine information that other people have, have created and harvest it in a way that tells a story. It's incredible. I find that early on when I was a professor, when I first, I finished my PhD when I was 34, and I was writing these papers on early generation artificial uh, intelligence using something called genetic algorithms, pretty sophisticated mathematics, to, to model decision-making mechanisms for public finance regimes. What did I just say? I don't even know what I just said. All I know is I wrote papers <laughs> on it and they got published in these really fancy academic journals. I can't read those papers now. I wrote them, I think, it's my name. <laughs> now, I actually write a column for The Atlantic that harvests the work of all of the greatest social scientists and neuroscientists writing work on happiness, and I combine their ideas together to tell a compelling story and tell people how they can use it. Why? Because my first curve is my fluid intelligence curve. My second curve is my crystallized intelligence curve, which is my professor curve, which is my teaching curve. And I found over the course of this research that that's why it was easier for me to do those public intellectual things, to explain relatively complex ideas like I'm doing right now, than I ever would have been able to 25 years ago. That's when I started doing this research, what was the really illuminating bit of information for me was that I needed to change. I quit my job as a CEO because of this work. Look, I gotta eat my own cooking. I have to, look, if I believe this thing, if I'm gonna write a book and I'm gonna, I want you to buy it and do the things in the book, I have to do it too. So I quit my job and I came back to academia and I became a professor, but not a research professor, a professor of practice writing for the public about relatively sophisticated ideas, but in, in terms that, that non-specialists can understand. I wanted to use my crystallized intelligence. Those are the two curves, and that's why I applied them in my life. Let's talk about some of the components of this. And can I stop one, one, one sure. thing about this? Sure. So let me talk to you about you just for a second. So for those of you who don't know, Must you? I, I serve because you're a good example of this. So Tully Friedman was, is one of the real pioneers of the private equity industry. And for those of you who live in, in San Francisco, you know who he is. He started two firms here in San Francisco, Hellman and Friedman, and Friedman, Fleischer, and Lowe. 
Before that, he worked in <clears throat> he worked in an investment firm in New York, and he was trained as a lawyer and that, so forth. Early on, he was innovating in the private equity industry. Later, as chairman of Friedman, Fleischer, and Lowe, his job was looking for talent that could do the amazing technical things at the forefront of the industry. That's a good, that's good talent. That's good talent. What? That's crystallized intelligence. You walked from your fluid intelligence curve when you were starting the business with Hellman and Friedman to when you were chairman of Friedman, Fleischer, and Lowe using crystallized intelligence in sort of the sine qua non of crystallized intelligence, which was why you were happy and why you were successful. Getting back to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you talk about, you have two numbers, the four habits of happiest of the happiest people, mm -hmm. and then you talk about a four, happiness 401k and the seven ways one can invest in it. I assume there's a Venn diagram that covers this, but talk about yeah. those two components. So on the, when, I, when I teach my, my students, or when by, I mean, when I travel around, I'm doing a lot of talks to various audiences, and they say, well, what do you teach in your happiness class for the Harvard Business School? And I say, well, I have an hour, so here's an hour-long version of it. And I talk about the genetic component of happiness and the circumstantial component and how, um, how you know, it's very hard to get satisfaction because your brain won't let you keep satisfaction very long, et cetera, et cetera. And some of these interesting uh, facets of the, the science of happiness. But then I say, look, when I've looked at the 10,000 academic journal articles about the happiest people, they all have four habits in common. There's lots and lots of little habits. And there's lots of academic journal articles out there. You know, should you do more cardio or more resistance training to get happy? All kinds of marginalia. None of this stuff really matters very much. There's four habits that will give you 25% of your happiness that will put it entirely under your control. These are four accounts that you need to put a deposit into each day. They are your faith, your family, your friendships, and your work. By your faith, I don't mean my faith. I'm a Roman Catholic. It's literally the most important thing in my life. But that's not what I'm saying because the data say that that's not what you have to do. The data say that you need to simply walk a transcendental path and, and focus on things that are bigger than your day-to-day -day existence. Okay? That means, maybe that means a meditation practice. Maybe that means studying the Stoics. Maybe that means traditional religion. Maybe that doesn't. But the whole point is you need something that will zoom out from your day-to-day -day existence on something bigger and put you in perspective. This is really critical to your happiness. The reason is because um, if you don't, then your day-to-day -day life will be my house, my car, you know, my television show, my friends, my money, me, me, me. It's so boring. It's like watching the same sitcom episode over and over and over again. Some concept of the bigger ideas of philosophy, faith, or spirituality are very important very important thing that to, to participate in. Second is, is family life, the ties that bind and won't break that you didn't choose. God knows you wouldn't in many cases. Maybe you had a tough Thanksgiving with Aunt Marge, you won't stop talking about Trump or whatever. <laughs> um, got it. I mean, this is San Francisco. That's all anybody talks about as far as I can tell, you know? Um, so, but, but you know what? Aunt Marge will take the call at 2 a.m. from you. Uh, and, and, and the truth is that one in six Americans today is not talking to a family member because of politics. It is crazy. That is just voluntarily handing over our happiness because we're so ideologically inclined. We're, we've got our priorities wrong in many of these cases. Now, in the cases of abuse, that's a different story. But in the cases of ideology, really? Third is friendship. We have a, we have a loneliness epidemic in this country. We can talk about it if you want. But one of the things that we find is that, that there's a, for strivers in particular, strivers are some of the loneliest people in the world. And the reason is because they have tons of friends, deal friends, not real friends. And you know the difference. And finally, work. And work has only two characteristics that will bring you joy, whether you're a college professor or a politician or a private equity manager or driving the bus. It does not matter for your happiness. You have to have two things in common. You have to earn your success, which is to say that you believe that your skills and your passions are meeting. You're being rewarded for your hard work and personal responsibility, number one. And number two is you feel like you're serving others, that you're serving people who need you, who honestly need you. If you have those two things, it's going to bring you joy. Faith, family, friends, and work. That is your portfolio. If you're missing something, and if you're a striver, you're probably over-indexing on work and under-indexing on one, two, and three. You need to get that portfolio in shape.
That's one of the things I talk about. The second thing, the second part of that question is this kind of basic happiness 401k plan, which is these, these uh, ideas, these investments that people make in themselves, which is related. There is a Venn diagram to be sure, but that comes from the Harvard Study of Adult Development, which is an 84 year longitudinal database that, that, that follows people from many walks of life from when they're teenagers until, until they're dead. And, and some of the original cohort are actually still alive, um, who are in their late 90s or even past 100 at this point. But they're also following their kids and grandkids and spouses, et cetera, et cetera. And they find that they all have seven things in common. They have seven things that they're doing, seven investments that they're making along the way, pretty commonly. The first four are physical. For happiness, they're physical. And it's pretty, pretty you know, what you'd expect. Smoking, drinking, diet, and exercise. Okay, and I don't have to, we all kind of know what the ideas in that are. Although it's actually simpler than we make it out to be. You don't have to have you know, intermittent fasting or you know, caveman diets, I don't know. It's basically, you know, eat a sensible diet, walk for an hour a day, you know, do things that you're supposed to do that are physiologically sound, that are not crazy, that are not hurting you, that are not hard to maintain, that you, that you kind of enjoy is what it comes down to. Those are the basic four. By the way, if there's in, the most interesting thing in that study, is really, it's really down on excessive alcohol consumption. It shows that, that, that one of the biggest reasons that people lack relationships in their life is because they drink, not vice versa. And so what the researchers say is if, there's, if you wonder at all about your drinking or there's, you have near relatives who have problem drinking, you should consider abstaining. Smoking is just dumb, just stop, is basically. <laughs> Um, and then the last three um, are behavioral. Number one is having a good coping mechanism for problems so that not ruminating, not being an excessive worrier. And you know, this, this transcendental walk really helps a lot for that. But if necessary, seeing a professional about your ability to deal with problems, because that's a big predictor of unhappiness and unwellness later in life. Next is lifelong learning. And that doesn't mean going to Harvard, that means reading an hour a day. And the last is, is what they say is the most important of all, which is summed up by the guy who ran the study for 30 years. Happiness is love, full stop. You need friends, you need, if you, if you have a successful uh, marriage or romantic partnership, that's fantastic. You need people who are very close to you, who know you, who are intimate with you, and that you can count on. That love is the single most important part of what they find in the study. Let's talk some more about faith. Um, how does your Catholic faith limit or enhance your friendship with the Dalai Lama and other friends of yours who are followers of Eastern religions? I know you've spent a lot of time in India. You spent a lot of time with swamis, gurus. Hmm. Yeah. It's an interesting facet. Yeah, it's, so it's, um, so you and I have met the Dalai Lama together many times. Yep. And the Dalai Lama I've been privileged to work closely with over the past 10 years. We've written, we've co-authored together. Um, <clears throat> he endorsed this book, as a matter of fact, and, and we, I've, ordinarily, in non-coronavirus times, I would see him every year in his home in Dharamsala, in his monastery in Dharamsala, and <clears throat> he has helped me to be a much better Roman Catholic. It's interesting, and that's his objective, actually, um, that Mother Teresa, Saint Teresa of Calcutta, now, one time was asked, you know, you work with Hindu teachers and masters, and you have such a warm relationship with the religions of, of India, Islam, Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, what gives? She said, oh yeah, you know, I love all religions, but I'm in love with Catholicism. And I kind of feel the same way. You know, I, I, I don't know if there are many ways to come to the same conclusions. All I know is what my heart tells me about my own faith. And, and, and I, I have to say that I do love all faiths and I have very substantial teachers. Every year when I go to India, I'll usually sit at the feet of the masters to learn. And I have to say, you know, I've learned my meditation technique much, much more from Buddhists than I have learned it from Catholics. And it's made me much deeper in my own faith than it could have been otherwise. And I actually kind of think that, that there's no other way that it could have been. I think these people were put in my path for a reason. Let, let's, let's pull out a little bit. Um, are you concerned about our society, about what we're <clears throat> teaching our kids, about norms and objectives? I'm really concerned, and I'm not concerned for all the conventional reasons. <clears throat> I mean, it's, there are lots of reasons you could say, well, there's all the things that people are so anxious about politically in this country, and sure, I get that, and I don't like those things. <clears throat> what I really see that concerns me the most is the data as a social scientist that, that it's very clear to me that love is in decline in this country. 
and in fact around the world. And I mean all different kinds of love. There's less and less friendship on display. There are worse relationships between parents and their children. People are having fewer children. And romantic love, which is the most nuclear fueled of all the sources ultimately of you know, the power of happiness in our lives, that is in just free fall. I mean, we find, for example, that <clears throat> people in their 20s are 35% less likely to be married than they were when I was, there was my age. Okay, and you're thinking, well, what about cohabitation? Also less likely. What about dating? Also less likely. What about sex? Also less likely. What about being in love? 30 percentage points less likely than when I was in my, in my 20s, in the 1980s. I mean, <clears throat> when I was in my 20s, what else was there? I mean, I, I mean, there's good stuff out there like music and, you know, paying my rent. But I wanted love. I mean, I was, that's what I was interested in. And, and, and the most exciting entrepreneurial venture of my life was falling in love with and desperately trying to convince a woman who didn't speak a word of English to marry me. And I didn't speak a word of Spanish. And so I literally moved to Barcelona on a wing and a prayer to try to convince this woman that she should marry me. It took me a year and a half and I closed the deal and we've been married 30 years. <laughs> I mean, that's what we did, those of you who are my age and older, that's what we did. You did it too. I mean, we're crazy. We did crazy things. And, and one of the things that I see among my students and among young people is this reluctance, this fear, this this force that's driving people apart, this polarity in our culture of fear and hatred, and it really worries me a lot because there's not a good future for people under these circumstances. Look, I mean, there's, there's always bad things, and there's always conflict, and <clears throat> there's nothing new under the sun. Every 10 years, there's a major crisis that's completely unexpected. Right now, it's coronavirus. 10 years ago, it was the financial crisis. 10 years before that, it was 9-11. 10 years before that, it was the end of the Soviet Union. And 10 years from now, it's going to be something. But if we don't have love, we can't get through this. We can't get through this because that's the only source of true happiness and strength that we have. So related, uh, everyone thinks there's, there's, a, there's general agreement there's a loneliness epidemic in our society. Are you concerned about that? What about the level of anxiety? How, how does that relate to what you're talking about here? So the fear that I'm talking about that I see among my students is palpable and really quite real. And, and, and there's a lot of research that asks, <clears throat> number one, is it true? And the data are unambiguously true that young people today are more afraid than people have been in the past. That's what actually leads to, that's what crowds out love. So Lao Tzu, you know, the author of the Tao Te Ching about 500 years BC, um, or for that matter, the Apostle John in the New Testament in the Christian Bible, um, so the perfect love drives out fear. They both said almost exactly the same words. And the reason is because the cognitive opposites, uh, and the philosophical opposites for that matter, are love and fear. It's not love and hatred. Hatred is a, is a side effect, it's a downstream effect of fear. And, and this fear epidemic that we actually have in our society is what's actually leading us to be driven apart. It's leading to all kinds of loneliness. Now, fear of what? And, and the answer is fear of everything. It's just extraordinary when I see that. I see fear of failure among my students. I see a fear of irrelevance, fear of, of being alone, of being together, uh, fear of intimacy, fear of rejection. I see all of this fear that, 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 is, that is making it impossible for people to actually take the chances that they need. I mean, think about it. The single most entrepreneurial thing that anybody, that ordinary people do in their lives is not starting a business. I mean, that's great, but that's not that scary compared to falling in love. That's the most entrepreneurial thing because it puts the most capital at risk, which is your heart, right? And, and having your heart stomped on is no fun. It's way worse than a bankruptcy. And, and okay, but, but that's part of life is the whole thing. And we don't have a culture in, in which people actually know how to do that because they're so debilitated by fear. Why? Well, <clears throat> there's a whole bunch of theories about why there's so much fear in our culture. One theory is this kind of polarity theory that says that you go between love and fear polarities in any family, any company, any culture, any society, and we're in a fear polarity. And what we need is leaders that actually change the polarity. Well, we don't have political leaders, certainly we're doing that. We have political leaders on the left and the right today that are trying to fire us up to all be afraid of everything and telling us that they're the only ones who can protect us from the bad guys who are the people in the house next door who vote for the other party, which is insane. That's a big mistake, and that's a disservice to, the, to America. That's number one. Another theory <clears throat> of this is that, that we have um, social media, 
which is pulling people apart, putting people in, 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 in silos, and it's actually making, giving people less and less experience interacting with each other in real life, which is no joke. <laughs> um, and we see this certainly among teenagers who have this kind of social junk food of social media where they don't have actual direct contact, which has strong, I mean, extreme neurophysiological consequences, starting with a neuropeptide that functions as a hormone in the brain that you've all heard of maybe called oxytocin. Oxytocin is produced endogenously, intensely, intensely pleasurable in response to eye contact and touch. And that will soothe your fear. And it will make you feel love. And it will make you feel warmth and contentment. And if all you're looking at is, is Instagram, you're not going to get it, is the bottom line. And last but not least is this theory that, peop that you know, people my age have screwed up the next generation in two ways. Number one is that we've protected them from, from any sort of conflict you know, by, by nannying them and, and hyper-parenting them and safetyism and, and all the things that we've done to them on campuses. And the second thing is, is that we've made them into child soldiers in a baby boomer culture war and said, you know what the real problem is? The people disagree. They're evil. They're stupid. They hate America. They're, they're denying your identity if they disagree with anything about your lifestyle. And, you know, young people are very are vulnerable to these, to these arguments. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sympathetic to all of these arguments, but I do say that, that we have a fear and loneliness epidemic on our hands as a result. You talk about fear of aging and intergenerational friendships, mm. and you also connect this to diversity. I thought that was one of the more interesting parts of the book. Can you, can you go back and talk about this? Yeah. Um, I was doing a talk at <clears throat> a Silicon Valley firm uh, a few years ago three years ago or so when I was first starting out on this book. And, and you know, I was talking to the, it, about happiness to the employees of this firm down on the peninsula. And, and afterward, when the, somebody asked me about you know, my views on the, the big diversity problem in their engineering profession, um, which is real, you know, women and people of color, et cetera, underrepresented in that profession. But then I said, so speaking of diversity, how many old people work here? they are like, over 30? <laughs> Punk. So, and, and, and I said, look, um, if you, one of the biggest problems that we have in our, in our economy today is that we are hyper abundant in fluid intelligence. I mean, look, we're, we're the epicenter of the universe in fluid intelligence and tech, right? Big ideas, tons of innovation, hustle culture, all of those things are, are part of, they're, they're, they're abundant when you have fluid intelligence. The problem with all fluid intelligence, no crystallized intelligence, means lots and lots of brains and no wisdom. How can social media and tech go from the most respected, most admired part of capitalism to near the bottom in 15 years? How do you pull that off? And the answer is by looking selfish, looking childish, doing things that, that you would never put up with. You could say, that's anti-competitive, don't do that. That's bro culture, don't do that. That's, uh, that's, that's exploitative and dangerous product. Don't do that. I mean, old people know this. Older people, and by the way, that's me now. <laughs> we, it's like we look at things, we say it's dumb on his face. And so one of the things that I'm talking about these days is the diversity that we need in companies. We have lots of kinds of diversity in companies because it makes stronger teams. But the one kind of diversity we really, really need, especially in tech, is every C-suite should have somebody over 70 in it. Every product team, every marketing team should have more people over 70. We should have an aftermarket for over 70 executives who are superstars that can save young people from themselves under these circumstances. And, and by the way, they could, quite frankly, they could save America. <laughs> Commonwealth Club is an older crowd. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that's right. So back to, let's call it deal friendships versus real friendships and the mm. workplace Talk about workplace, workplace friendships and the, the sort of the IEDs there and how you view it. Yeah, so the, the, I, I do a lot of work with the Gallup polling organization, which does just outstanding data analysis and data gathering, <clears throat> especially in workplaces. And what you find is that most people get most of their friendship at work. 58% of people say they wouldn't take a higher paying job if it meant leaving their friends at work. 70% of people have a best friend at work. 17% of spouses meet at work. It's incredibly important to people. So this is the most amazing thing in the wake of the coronavirus epidemic where companies are trying to say like, hey, you know, people are unbelievably productive on Zoom. Let's just never get back together again. That is crazy. You know, people will say, yeah, I want to stay at home because the first law of human resource physics is that, that employees at home tend to stay at home, 
right? Because it's convenient to be sure, but we are way lonelier and way more depressed than we think. This is the biggest mental health crisis wave. It's a tsunami coming at us right now because people don't realize how depressed they are. Or in ordinary times, about 9.5% of Americans are exhibiting symptoms of clinical depression. Right now it's 28%. Oh, I think I'll stay home from work forever. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty good. I got to move back to Albuquerque and be near my grandparents. It's all good, right? But the truth is you need to see humans every single day. And in the context of work where there's common striving, it's especially productive. And so that's really important. Workplace friendships are incredibly important. Now, there's one group that doesn't get workplace friends, and that's the boss. That's the real striver. And this is one of the things, that, one of the reasons that the boss, who's never alone, is often the loneliest person in the workplace. And nobody feels sorry for the boss, like the world's smallest violin, right? But I have data that show that that is the average, most unpleasant part of a worker's day, is spending time with her boss. And, you know, it's like, I remember reading those data. It's a, it's a study by Danny Kahneman, who's a psychologist at Princeton. And it's a really well done study. It's a beautiful study, as a matter of fact. And the paper came out not long before I took over at AEI. And I was wondering why every time as president of AEI, I mean, these are my old colleagues, my old friends. These are people that I worked with for years. And every time I'd go, after I became president, every time I go into the lunchroom, you know, people stop talking. It's like, what the, you know? And I realized if they didn't, it's not that they didn't like me, it's just that it's not that fun to have lunch with the boss. Why? Because you don't, people don't like being bossed. People don't like being evaluated all the time. They want to just relax. And that's one of the reasons that bosses are unbelievably lonely. Because whereas all of their colleagues who are working there have real friends, the boss only has deal friends. And so one of the things I talk about in this book, and I talk about a lot as I'm coaching executives and I'm working with companies, is making sure that managers and people with supervisory authority, that they're going outside of their workplaces to cultivate and establish real friendship. Okay, we have a related, I think, online question. Yeah. What do you think about the pandemic and happiness? Is the news all bad? <laughs> yeah. No, so the workplace it, pandemic. Yeah. So the, the pandemic has been unambiguously really hard on happiness in the United States. And this is um, exacerbating a trend that we've seen going back to the late 1980s, where happiness has been in gradual decline in the United States for a long time has been in gradual decline in the United States for more than 30 years. Uh, just gradually, just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. There's a lot of theories as opposed to why that is, but let me fill you in. Faith, family, friends, and work. That's the reason, is because we have, have not been going after these institutions, and, and we've been, we have a culture that's saying these institutions are less important than they were in the past. That's the reason, I think. Um, it's the most plausible reason. But the coronavirus epidemic dropped the bottom out of this. Um, during the coronavirus epidemic, you saw so much mental stress. You saw such high levels of anxiety. You saw so much uh, um, alcohol and drug abuse that we've never seen before, which is nothing more than self-medication. I mean, virtually all uh, uh, addictive activity, whether it's workaholism or, or alcoholism, is self-medication in, in the vast majority of cases that we saw that really on the rise. Uh, we have not come back yet for the happy, from the unhappiness from the coronavirus epidemic, but we actually do see some signs of life. And what I'm talking to people about an awful lot is trying to figure out what in that experience can actually be cultivated into a, into a deep source of purpose and meaning. And the reason for this is, remember I told you there are three macronutrients, enjoyment, satisfaction, and purpose. Purpose is a very paradoxical part of happiness. You know, one of the, one of the reasons that people who have teenage kids that they're not enjoying life is, well, that's obvious why they're not enjoying life because, you know, teenage kids. But what they get from that after they move out is lots of purpose and meaning. It's an incredible thing. And you learn a lot about yourself from actually suffering through relationships that are attenuated with people that you love. Well, the same thing is true with almost any source of suffering, of any source of of challenge that we have, that we have to, that, that tests our resiliency. Um, you cannot actually find purpose and meaning with, with psychological hedonism, which is a real phenomenon, where, and a lot of young people fall prey to this, where it's like, I'm going to spend all of my energy trying not to be unhappy, all of my energy trying not to suffer. It's kind of like the opposite of the Woodstock generation, which is, if it feels good, do it. Now, if it, if it feels bad, treat it. If it feels bad, stop it. That's a bad strategy if you want to have purpose and meaning in your life, because you, suffering is... It can, be, it can be too much and it becomes a medical problem, but for or, under ordinary circumstances, suffering is very sacred. 
and, and, it, and it's something that helps us understand who we are as people. And we don't have to go looking for it. It will find us, but we can't waste it. And this is what I ask people all the time. What did you learn during the coronavirus epidemic? Don't talk to me about what you hated about it. Don't talk to me about what you missed during it. Talk to me about what you didn't miss. The toxic relationships, the materialism, the wasted time that you're not going to go back to because you learned about yourself. Talk to me about the things that you loved during it. Like, I got to eat lunch with my wife every day. It was crazy. For a year, my wife and I ate lunch together every day. It was great. I love eating lunch with my wife. I didn't know that. And, and that was a beautiful thing, as a matter of fact. I mean, there are lots of problems during the coronavirus epidemic. I really got on her nerves. She's like, oh, I wish you didn't travel so much. And then during coronavirus, she's like, no trips? <laughs> you know? Uh, um, but, but, you know, it's really important because and these are the questions that we all need to ask if we want to find the purpose and meaning that actually came from this induced um, and uninvited period of, of, of change. Okay, from an online viewer, <clears throat> could you say something about those of us who have physical limitations, very few family, no religion in their background, or serious financial problems? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, almost, I mean, a lot of people fall into at least one of these particular categories, and falling into all four is, is re it's tremendously hard. Yeah. I mean, these are, these are real barriers, and one of the things that we, we study in the science of happiness is not just the sources of happiness, but the sources of unhappiness. They're not the same, and they're not opposites. Like, light is the opposite of darkness. Unhappiness is not the opposite of happiness. They're cognitively processed in physically different parts of the brain, in different hemispheres of the brain, as a matter of fact. However, one turns the other off. You can't be processing happy and unhappy cognition simultaneously. One of the greatest sources of unhappiness is the blockages to the sources of happiness is what we're talking about here. And one of the things that I think that we, what we need to do as people, as those of us who, who don't face all of these, or even many of these barriers, is to be looking for our sisters and brothers who are. One of the greatest services that you can, you can provide for somebody else is taking away their blockages to happiness. Ask about the people in your life, your neighbors, your friends, your loved ones, your family, about the blockages they have to their walking their spiritual path, whether they're religious or not. About their, the, the financial needs that would make it actually possible for them to, to live in the, you know, the most basic of circumstances. These are in the Catholic Church called the corporal and spiritual acts of mercy, but they're just basic human decency. And there's an incredible opportunity for all of us to lift each other up more. Now, for people who don't have anybody who's doing this in their lives, one of the most interesting things that you find is that those who are happy notwithstanding these barriers, these are the ones who are actually serving people even though they have these barriers. It's an extraordinary thing that I've done in my research that I found that some of the most generous people that I've ever met they look like the people who are most marginalized in their society. The people who have the least are some of the people who give the most. And why? Because they've cracked the code. They've cracked the code to love. And, and, and so this is one of the things that I often talk about with people who, are, who really, really are you know, stuck in, in some of these margins, is how they can actually be part of other people's lives more effectively. Now, before I ask my final question, I'm going to invite the audience again to submit any other questions you have. Put them down on the cards, send them up. And uh, online, uh, I think there's a way to do that. So let's, let's, it's the end of our piece. Let's talk about timing. Why wait for the second half of your life to find deep purpose? Is it ever too late to turn from money, power, pleasure, and fame? Is there hope for Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> So I talked about the virtuous four investments, which is faith, family, friendship, and work, where you serve others. But there's a kind of a vicious four, too. These are the things that your brain and Madison Avenue and the entertainment industry and your neighbors tell you that should give you satisfaction and happiness, which is money, power, pleasure, and fame. And by fame, I don't necessarily mean fame, like Kardashian fame. I mean prestige and admiration of other people, because this is what we all want. We want to be admired by other people. It would be absurd, would be strange, it would be unnatural if we didn't want this. These are the things that always promise everything, but they don't deliver. And the amazing thing is we don't learn. It's like, oh yeah, you know, it's like, and I mean, I remember, I remember you told me this one time. You know, you said, it was interesting, you said, um, you know, you thought that you'd get real satisfaction if you bought a Mercedes. And you bought a Mercedes and you're like, huh, it's not that great, right? And I thought, well, let me try. 
but you know, but th why? Because these are the these are the idols. According to Saint Thomas Aquinas, these are literally the idols that we seek. And what we need to do is to migrate systematically over our life. This is the secret to getting one of the great secrets that all older people were happy to have is they migrate from money, power, pleasure, and fame to faith, family, friends, and work. Faith, family, friends, and work. And work doesn't mean earning money. Mean, work means your human endeavor serving other people. That's what it comes down to. So that's what we actually need to do. The sooner you start that migration, the better off you're going to be. Just like, you know, I'm an economist. So if you ask me about your 401k plan, I would say, well, talk to a financial professional like Kelly Friedman. But I will tell you that the sooner you start to save, the better off you're going to be when you retire. The same thing is true for your 401k plan for happiness. The earlier you start thinking about the right institutions, making the right investments, making the prudential judgments about actually what will make you happy, what's written on your heart, the better off you're going to be. Does that mean that it's ever too late? No. As long as you've got breath in your lungs and life in your body, start doing those things. Start making those investments. And you, no matter what, I'm not going to promise you'll be happy, but I can promise you, you will be happier. And, and life is in progress. That's really what it comes down to. And when it comes down to Donald Trump, I'm waiting for him to at, call me and ask for my happiness advice, and then I'll be happy to dispense it at that point. <laughs> okay, I think we've got some questions en route. Say something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Filibuster. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's interesting. You know, the, um, I've been talking an awful lot about this particular book, and I have to say that I learn more and more about what actually is, strikes people the most in, in this particular book. And it's funny because it turns out that probably the last thing in the book g catches people the most, which is I say, you know, it, you know when, I, when I read a book, I can't remember it. So what, what I really always want when I'm reading a book is I want the author to sum it up. Just give me a little formula at the end for the whole book. That's what I always want. And they never do that. So I'm, like, oh, I'm going to do that, right? But okay, how can I sum up the wrong thing to do in just a few words, and then the right thing to do in just a few words, okay? So I said, okay, the wrong thing to do, here's the wrong formula. Here's the formula for getting on the lower branch of the happiness curve, okay? Use people, love things, and worship yourself, right? And that's what the whole world tells you to do. You know, the limbic system of your brain is your automatic lizard brain, right? It tells you to do that. And, and, you know, social media and entertainment industry and all of media is kind of a large digital distributed limbic system of the brain that's driving you to your animal instincts. Use people for your own satisfaction and purposes and getting ahead. Love things because if you get the boat, you'll finally be happy and satisfied. And worship yourself because you're the, you're the, you're the center of everything. That's completely wrong. Here's the right. The right formula is suspiciously similar. It just changes the verbs and the nouns. The right formula, my whole book, is in these seven words. Love people, use things, and worship the divine. And all will be well. These are worth waiting for. All right. Okay. All the 19th and 20th century historical figures you refer to are white men. Mm. How is the history of the philosophy of happiness influence different for women and non-white peran European communities? Yeah, so there is a lot of research on that. And, and I do, in the book, um, I do talk about people who are not white men. <laughs> Just to, uh, there are women in the book and there are people um, who are not white in the book. And, and I was very conscious about doing that because one of the things that I know about studying happiness for a living is that actually all of our experience is largely the same as human beings, but you have to prove that. You gotta prove that by looking at people in different walks of life, from different cultures, from different sets of experiences, who have had good and bad experiences based on what the slings and arrows of society, for sure. And what you find is that largely the set of experiences are the same. However, one of the big differences that you do see um, non-negligible differences, I should say, that you do see are, are that of women who are in their 60s and 70s today. And part of the reason is because they've had a more of a conventional family background. They were unlikely to experience the fluid intelligence curve in terms of their success at work the same way. Now, one of the things that you find is one of the reasons that women in their 60s and 70s tend to be some of the happiest people in our society is precisely because of that. Now, I want everybody to have the same opportunities. I'm a warrior for equal opportunity, complete warrior for it. But I have to recognize that if you don't get stuck on the fluid intelligence curve and you can be in your, your, your 
grandparent curve, which is your crystallized intelligence curve, you can be more comfortable with that. You can actually be, feel much more successful and better about your life later on. So this kind of is almost as if a lot of women in their 60s and 70s have cracked the code and we can learn from them. They can learn from them about playing to their own strengths and not being regretful about some job that's long past. Now, what happens then in, in among my students? My students are 50% women, 50% men, and they're all, I mean, the women are, they're, they're, gonna, they're killing it. They're going to they're going to have the same leadership opportunities, same leadership responsibilities. They're going to have the same opportunities to express their fluid intelligence the same way that men do, and they have the same fluid intelligence as men. Don't get me wrong; they're the same. I mean, the structure of the brain is is negligibly different, and so these the fluid intelligence curves are are pretty much the same. We have to remind men and women today to not make the mistakes of the hero on the plane. And one of the people that, I, by the way, that I, I I interviewed, I interviewed some professional athletes for this book. And one of the people I interviewed for the book was Dominique Dawes, who was an Olympic gold medal gymnast from 1996, and who struggled and struggled and struggled to figure out what she's supposed to do after getting off the fluid intelligence curve of what she was doing early on in her career, and really cracked the code with faith, family, friendship, and meaningful work where she's serving other people. And so that, that case study is in the book is, is emblematic of somebody who didn't have the conventional um, uh, experience of women who are currently in their 60s and 70s. The bottom line is this. We all want happiness. We're all going to get the same cognitive patterns. Our experiences may differ, but the more that we know about the commonalities that we have as human beings with the same hearts, the better off we're all going to be, and the better we can share these ideas with others. I think I heard you answer this question from the audience at Brown University in front of an initially very hostile audience sitting there like this. At Brown University yeah. Hostel? Can That's you talk weird. about yeah. Yeah. helping? I think this person is looking for help with a family member where there's a political divide. Yeah, yeah. Remember that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. How do you deal with a family member who is, uh, where there's a political divide? I mean, this is, again, one in six Americans is not talking to a family member because of politics today. There's, no, there's nothing strange about that. The main reason that there will be a, a, a complete estrangement between parents and their adult children is not because of the way that their adult children are living, which might be completely contrary to the values of the parents. It's not because of that. That's almost never the case. It's because of the rejection of the parents' values. Because that feels like a personal attack in every particular case. And a lot of those cases, weirdly, it's ideological or political. And so how do you repair something like that? And part of it is keeping in perspective how important these things actually are. One of the, thi one of the great uh, mistakes that we've made as a society that's in a fear polarity. And, and again, the last book that I wrote before this one was called Love Your Enemies, and it was about repairing these differences. So I've given this an awful lot of thought. The biggest mistake that we make is that we, we have these values, and we all have our values, but we use them as a weapon and not as a gift. Look, if your job is to, if, if you believe something truly in your heart, it's really important to you, you should want to persuade other people. You shouldn't want to alienate them because one of the things you all know is that nobody in history has ever been insulted into agreement. It's almost, I mean, it's an absurd truism. And, and, and furthermore, we love people who disagree with us. We don't love their opinions, but we love the people who disagree with us. Why would we not want to give them the gift of our values? And the, the way that you give people the gift of your values is by starting by listening to theirs, is what it comes down to. Even if it's obnoxious, even if it's difficult, we actually should have the strength to be able to do that. But what are we hearing all the time? Look, if somebody says something that's, that's obnoxious to you, then they've denied your right to I, exist, or you know, all these just completely blown, blown out of proportion ideas. We can actually listen to people in ways that we, we're much more resilient than we've been in the past, and we have actually a, a, a fighting chance. And again, I'm talking to people all the time who disagree with me. I've tested these ideas in, in the laboratory with the strongest Sanders and Trump supporters. How do you do that, by the way? How do you do that? How do you get them to talk to each other, listen to each other? You ask them to start by, by talking about their kids to each other. And when they realize that they have the same hearts and they, have, they experience love in the same way, and if they have teenage kids, they have the same kind of common enemy, that they actually realize they can put their political views in perspective in a way where they can listen to each other in a way that's more comprehensive, that's more interesting, that's more interested, where they can be more persuaded and even more persuadable. And that's how we start. I think that's a great spot, place to end. Thanks very much, Arthur. Thank you, Tully. And thanks to all of you. Thanks. 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 Very good. Thanks.